Before we jump into this conversation, just a quick word of thanks to the good folks over at the Quilty Nook. Without your ongoing support, projects like this just wouldn't be possible. You're listening to Seamside, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster, and in each episode, we explore what working with cloth has taught us about being human. I hope you enjoy. Y'all know how much your reviews mean to me. They really are how other people discover this show that you love so much. Take Denise Tackett, for example, who recently wrote, I love your gentle way of communicating with your guests and the way you bring in not only their work, but their lifestyles. She goes on to say that she listens to it while she's on her treadmill, and it just makes the whole experience, what is it, less deadly boring and more beautiful. So I'm here for it. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a quick review. I sure would appreciate it. If you don't know Culture Fussell, and by the way, it is Fussell, like Russell, she'll tell you, but she's too nice to correct you, so take it from me. If you don't know Culture Fussell, I don't know where you've been, but today is your lucky day, because you're about to get a big ol' helping of Culture Fussell. In this conversation, we talk about the role community plays in Culture's work, and because she's got a studio in an old storefront in downtown, we talk about the role that she plays in her community. We also talk about how she maintains hope in the midst of conflict and turmoil. We talk about the South and family lineage, complicated though it may be. And of course, we talk about how textiles make us more human. I hope you enjoy this conversation with my good friend, Coulter Fussell. Coulter, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Hey, Zach. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Now, paint the scene for us a little bit. Tell us where you are. Well, I'm sitting in my house in Water Valley, Mississippi, which is this little town in the northern rural hill country of Mississippi. And I'm at my house because my studio doesn't have internet. (laughs) So I would normally, you know, if I had internet, I'd be doing this down the street at my studio, which is about a block away. But yeah, so I'm in my home. I've sort of got this old Victorian home in this tiny little town. And um, I'm sitting in my living room looking out the window. (laughs) And what's the weather like today where you're sitting? It's cloudy and overcast, but it's mm-hmm. fairly warm, so, you know, that's good. Mississippi for you. And then after you get off the chat with me this morning, are you going to the studio? I am. I'm going to walk down the street and go work on some pieces. Yeah, that's how I'll spend the rest of the day until the kids get home from school. That uh, sounds like a pretty good life, pretty mm-hmm. good setup. Mm-hmm. What are you working on right now in the studio? Right now, I'm working on a series of these, like, quilted wall sculptures that are going to go to the Wiregrass Museum in Dothan, Alabama. And, yeah, so I've got about four big pieces that I'm trying to whip up real quick. Oh, (laughs) just crank out like that (laughs) real fast. Well, that's like I'm sitting here. I just got this idea for the quilt last night. And so I'm using this old quilt that literally I found in a trash can in one of my residences. Someone's thrown it away. It's this old hand-quilted piece. Gorgeous, like nine block. I don't know the names of blocks. Nine patches, but yeah. turned up on diamonds, turned up on their points. And uh, I'm using the back side because it's all just a neutral yeah. muslin. And I am hand sewing 2,047 little squares of fabric to the back. Wow, that's great. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 I want each of those little squares are about the size of a postage stamp, mm-hmm. represent a direct ancestor. So a grandfather or grandmother. Yeah. And they're going to be color coded. So that you see me, like I'll probably be like a little red square somewhere. And then you'll see my direct ancestors that I personally know. Yeah. Which of course is only six, right? So right. me, my parents, and my grandparents. And then there will be, I don't know, probably like a camel colored of uh, mm-hmm. ancestors that are within living memory. So that'll be the grandparents of my grandparents. But the vast majority of the squares are just going to be black. Yeah. And I want a visual that shows how much we don't know about yeah. where we're coming from. Right. And how rich the ground is to explore. And I know we'll get there because so much of your work is based on the South. My work these days, a lot is based on the South as well. And uh, I know we'll get there. Yeah. And, you know, quilts do carry with them, uh, you know, in general, all that sort of unknown anonymity of the people who came before you. You know, that's sort of like Mm -hmm. always ingrained in quilts and the tradition or whatever. And so... I like that you are sort of making that into the direct part of the abstraction, you know. So that's a cool idea. I like it. 
Well, I ran across a turn of phrase of yours, and this might be a good place to start thinking about your work, which is, you know, you, what I call the culture fussel model, which is you have this in my public studio in your mm-hmm. town where people can come drop off clothes. And you referred to, at least in your artist statement once, you referred to the act of sorting through these donations as an act of archaeology. Yeah, it feels archaeological because sort of diving into this stuff with no real knowledge of what, you know, the path of where it all came from, except, you know, what I've sort of like gathered from experience from doing it before, you know. So, you know, I'll get a, a bag of donations. And there are clues in there as to what the person or person's life was before. And it's really a matter of deciphering those clues. And, you know, when I first started, I wouldn't know where in the world any of this stuff came from or whatever. But, you know, the more you (laughs) dig through trash, you know, the more you see, like, commonalities or whatever, you know, like, what was, like, sun bleached, where that might have been, what kind of house that might have been in, who might have made this certain dress, under what conditions did it fall apart, you know. Those are all the things that I'm looking for. Those are all the things that I specifically want. And they're not just signs of degradation. Like, I like stuff that's absolutely, completely brand new. You know, I'll take a t-shirt somebody bought yesterday at Walmart, because that's still a journey. And uh, so, you know, that's sort of what I'm looking for, like, signs of life, you know. Can you think of a time when you learned something really intimate about somebody yeah. through their clothes? Maybe you didn't know the person. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> what you got? What comes well, to mind? first of all, bed sheets tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, sometimes I find little love note, you know, school pictures with little notes written on the back telling, you know, the girlfriend that you love her, you miss her, whatever. I often find receipts of bank statements, a lot of stuff about money, you know, like a blank check, whole blank checkbook sometimes. Yeah, like a booklet of like all personal expenses, you know. And so I'm like, you know, reading through how much somebody spent on, you know, groceries and clothes or whatever that month. So, you know, recipes, all sorts of stuff. Then how do these things, or if they do, how do they wind up in your work? Well, I mean, they wind up in my work because they come to me. Like, really, I use this stuff not necessarily because, like, I'm attracted to the actual material as it is. I use it because it wound up with me. So what I'm really sort of attracted to is the fact that it got here. You know, the journey and the process it took for it to all wind up with me. You know, it feels sort of like faded, you know. It could easily be any other material in the world. Like the bag of donations I get could be a bag of just different donations, you know, and I would still mm-hmm. use it because mm-hmm. it all came to me, you know. Kind of well, fascinating. It reminds me. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Culture, if I could just jump in one second, because mm-hmm. it reminds me of this moment that I had several years ago where I'm sitting there at a koi pond, right? And somebody's in this, like, park, and... There's this little beam of sunlight makes its way through the trees and like shining through the water in the koi pond and like lighting up some leaves on the bottom. And I think, I don't know why, what it was about that particular sunbeam, but I'm like, that light just traveled eight minutes from sun to get here to the bottom of this koi pond at the top. Yeah. And there's something about that specificity that does feel really special. Yeah, I like the when all points lead here sort of thing. I mean, textiles, I can understand you use them, but what about the bank statements and the photographs and the packs of cigarettes and stuff? Do you ever do anything with those? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I didn't start out doing much with that, but I always kept everything. So it was always in my studio piling up over these years. And then eventually I just started putting that stuff in there, too. Because, you know, it looked cool, it was, like, interesting, or it was funny, and, like, and also, you know, I'm not a purist about anything. Like, it didn't have to be fabric, you know? So, yeah, I eventually just started including it all, and, you know, I do want the focus to always be the textiles. I mean, that's truly what I love the most. But, yeah, there's this other stuff that circulates around the textiles that I include as well. You know, if you get a pair of pants, you don't just get the pair of pants in, you get the dollar bill that's in the pocket. You know, you don't just like other, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Get a, you get all this other stuff that humans put in their clothes. So, yeah. That'd make a beautiful altar. (laughs) 
Now, people give you this stuff Mm -hmm. and you sort through it and folks can go back and listen to softball because it's hard to believe culture, but it's been a year since we had that conversation. Yeah, that's wild. And so folks that want to get a sneak peek of your studio and your process can see how you have this big open space and, uh, you know, former store and you've got piles of clothes all over the place sorted by color and you work on the floor, right? They can see pictures of all those that you Mm -hmm. shared and I would encourage them to do that. What is so interesting to me about the way you work is that because you work in a semi-public space where people are just donating clothes to you, that you're really involving the community in your creative process. And I'm wondering if there are other ways besides the donated materials that you find that the people around you or the place that you're in, the community that you're in, are there other ways besides just the donated materials that have affected your practice? Yeah, well, I mean, I've got like a group of girlfriends here that, you know, that are quilters and stuff. And so we all hang out together and we do our various crafts and artistic pursuits. Some are photographers, some are quilters, all sorts of stuff. But in terms of my store, like, you know, it got to the point now where it's like such a full studio that people can hardly make it past the door. (laughs) You know, like it, there is so much stuff in there and so many big pieces and everything's like working and, you know, power tools everywhere, like saws set up, you know, it's to the point now where like people just sort of poke their head in and look around, <laughs> you know, but yeah, you know, I think bringing me the clothes is really, that's the exchange. You know, I get to know people that way. Uh, You know, sometimes it's just totally anonymous bags left there. And then sometimes the donations will come with notes and they tell me about, you know, the great aunt or whatever, whose stuff that is. And then sometimes they'll come in themselves and bring all the stuff and tell me all about their relative or set of relatives whose stuff this was, you know. People will stop me on the street and tell me about some donations they're going to bring. But in terms of like the actual creative making of the stuff, I'm very much like a lone artist. I want to be in there by myself, you know, and I want it to be quiet. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll listen to stuff through my headphones, but like, I don't know if I could actually work around another person. You know, I spend many, many hours a day alone doing that. So, yeah. What have people shown you or what have you learned or what have you intuited about how they feel about all this stuff they're bringing you? I'm asking because recently I had a conversation with Catherine Greenwood Swanson, who runs a secondhand fabric shop Mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. And she says there can be a lot of complex feeling around what people bring in. And I'm just wondering what your experience with that has been. Well, what I experience is that people feel relieved to give it to me because like, They've got all this stuff. They want to get it off. You know, they've inherited it, but they don't want to throw it away because they feel bad about throwing it away, you know, because they know that, like, Grandmama loved it. She loved to sew. So then they bring it to me, and it, it sort of relieves them of the burden of, like, having to deal with the material stuff, you know, and having to have any guilt that they threw it in the trash can because they know it's not going in the trash. And they know that like within a few months, probably they'll see some of that stuff in an artwork somewhere on a wall. You know, I use stuff like almost immediately. You can even see like top of the pile. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You can even see on my Instagram sometimes, like every now and then in the comments, somebody will pipe up and be like, that's my mom's comforter. You know, I mean, they're bringing it to me because they want me to have it several. And you understand Zach, with memory quilts, I think that's when the feelings get really more, you know, complicated and emotional. But oftentimes with, like, my regular, like, studio work, people know it, they're donating this stuff. It's going to get cut up, and it's going to go into something kind of wild and crazy and of my own creation. So That's going to get a second life. Yeah, that's right. How long have you been in the studio space? I got that studio in 2015, and... Before that, me and my close friend Megan Patton, she's a quilter. She's Doe Quilts on Instagram, D-O-E Quilt. She and I had this little gallery right down the street. It was 10 feet wide and 40 feet long. (laughs) We brought in artists from all over to have like little miniature shows there, and it was so much fun. And in the back of that, she and I shared painting studio. And uh, we went to college together and stuff and waited tables together for years. So we had our painting studio back there, and then Megan started sewing, and I started sewing, and eventually I needed more room because, you know, you're working in quilt. Ten feet wide isn't going to cut it. 
<laughs> if you're making like <laughs> not at all massive you know pieces of work and, and you know and in my case I work on the floor like real big so yeah in 2015 I went to a bigger space right down the street and how did that affect your process well I was able to do things a lot bigger I was able to have a lot more supplies so I could really start hoarding, you know, and like, that's what I do. (laughs) Like, I don't throw anything away that they bring me. Like every now and then I'll come through and if there's like 500 white t-shirt, you know, like I'll donate those. But like, you know, I keep it all because I know that eventually I'll come around to using it. So just having the big space really expanded my work because I was able to just physically do more, you know, because there was more room to do it. And I had more supplies I could work with because there was more room to store them. I mean, it's not a fancy space by any means. It's not heated. It's not air conditioned. The running water doesn't work because... <laughs> you, you still know. don't have that bathroom fixed? No, I don't. But I mean, I only live a block away, you know. So I'm like, do I pay yeah, the plumber or do I just go home? So anyway, like the studio is a hot mess. But what it is, is that it's big. I love it. So much. Were you working in series before you moved to that larger space? You know, I didn't work in series until I got there. I worked in series with painting when I was at the Little Bitty Gallery, Little Bitty Space. But, you know, I didn't, like, really start working in textiles in any serious way until I got to that big space. I mean, I had been making quilts, but I certainly wasn't making, like, 12 at a time or anything. So... Well, and now you do, right? Is my understanding mm-hmm. you'd like to work on multiple projects concurrently? Yeah, I do. And I like to work on, like, if I have a series, I want to make, like, eight of them, you know, 10, 12. And then I'll have a series of something else. It takes a while to get a thought out. And sometimes the thought it can't all be in one piece. Sometimes there's all sorts of different things I kind of want to say about what I'm generally thinking. And so it takes a bunch of pieces to sort of cover it all. Yeah. It also re- takes some pressure off any singular particular piece, doesn't it? I know with the body of work that I'm working on with Southern White Amnesia, it's a rich topic. Mm-hmm. And there's a, a lot I want to explore there. But I'm thankful that no one quilt has to carry the whole narrative. No, and it couldn't right? anyway. And, yeah. And it couldn't. And if it did, well, what would that be? You'd make the quilt and then you'd be done. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, your well, I, I explained it all. <laughs> <laughs> drop mic and walk talk. out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I do view it though as almost like studying a gemstone or something right that has multiple yeah. facets and you're like each quilt is its own facet and mm-hmm. before this collection and I know we'll get into this here in a little bit but before this collection I hadn't found myself thinking in terms of multi-piece narrative arc mm-hmm. right and like how what kind of story do I want to tell yeah. over the span of several pieces and that's been really fun to explore yeah And I imagine a larger space is helpful. Yeah, it is. Having the extra space really allows for you to explore more fully an idea because like what I'll often do is I will make a series around a certain idea or notion that I'm thinking of. And then I'll go on to another series and then come back to that first one and rework those pieces. You know, Mm -hmm. like I'll take stuff out of them and put them into new work or they're sort of a catalyst to like further develop more pieces down the road. And, you know, having a bigger space to do that is helpful. I mean, I think you could do it with small works, obviously, if you had a smaller space. And, you know, you could do it with big works too. But I tend to work on many pieces at one time. So I'll have, like right now in the studio, I have four large pieces going at once. And that's sort of how I can time together because I'll share materials between the pieces and everything. Yeah, I like that. This might be a good time. I did want to chat with you some about the show that was still in the future uh-huh. back when we last talked on <laughs> Off Bulk, but is now happened and closed and shut up. But then also talk about what you're doing now. So when we last chatted, you were working on it. So you're about to put up a show called My Love for You is Undying. Is Death that the right lit. word? Deathless. Deathless. Yeah, my love for you is deathless. Yeah. You got that show up. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were exploring with that particular collection? Yeah, so that show was part of my War Quilt series. So the War Quilt series is really sort of a series of quilts that really, I guess it explores like the nature of conflict between entities or whatever. So that has to do with like, you know, big global conflicts and then like You can really get down to, like, microcosms of that, like, in the family or whatever, or between people. What I've realized over the years is that 
those, the tendencies in conflict are all the same, whether it's like a country fighting a country or a person forced to fight another person, you know, and um, my war quilt series is sort of all about the nature of, you know, entities, mutton heads. My Love for You is Deathless is a title. I got that from, I was watching the Ken Burns Civil War documentary for like the millionth time. And there was this part for this Union soldier. He wrote a love letter, or really it's a goodbye letter, home to his wife. It's real sad, like the fiddle music's playing, you know. And um, one of the lines he says, my love for you is deathless. And he's about to die on the battlefield, you know. It's so beautiful. Like, it's such a beautiful thing to tell her that I'm sure she appreciates or appreciated. But seeing through a different light, it could be really, <laughs> you know, really threatening in a way. And I don't think she saw it that way. Who knows? I didn't know her. But, like, to have somebody tell you that their love for you is deathless under different circumstances could be really an awful thing. And um, so my... War Quilt series is sort of a, like this fine line sometimes between like love and obsession, you know, admiration and voyeurism, sort of how that all plays into conflict and stuff. So, yeah. You have this one piece about the Potomac, mm-hmm. kind of reflecting on George Washington sailing down the Potomac. You found yourself thinking about the animals on the banks of the river mm-hmm. and, and especially the deer, right? Yeah. And what they might be thinking. Yeah. And in the moment you were sharing that, you kind of glossed over what the animals might actually be thinking. But I found myself wondering, Coulter, what were the animals telling you when you were <laughs> working on this piece? I don't know. I think sometimes that's what I'm wondering, too. But, you know, so the idea of that piece was sort of inspired by, like, famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. The piece I made is called The Banks of the Potomac. And it's, like, built on top of this, like, dollar bill floor mat that I got in, this other dollar bill blanket. But it's sort of this fantastical alternate historical event where, you know, as this, like, historical figure is doing this famous thing that's supposed to have, I guess, did change the course of history here, what were the animals on the bank thinking watching that go down? Like, how sort of the natural world keeps on rolling and then we're doing all this, like, crazy shit, basically. (laughs) (laughs) And then how us doing these crazy things and these, like, violent, wild things we do and how it does wind up ultimately affecting the natural world. And so that was sort of a fantastical alternate reality where as he crosses the Potomac or the painting of Delaware, the plants and animals sort of take over. Like, the kudzu grows over the bank. So, you know, big catfish roll in the river, you know, the deer appear on the banks and he never makes it across. You know, the, the natural world takes it all back sort of before he got to change it all. So I tend to sort of include a lot of stuff about the natural world in my artwork. I mean, I'm out here in it in the country. So, but yeah, what specifically the deer was thinking, I don't know. Well, we'll just leave that to the viewer <laughs> to ponder for themselves. That's right. I was on a walk yesterday, and I was thinking about this piece, the one I'm sewing on now that I told you about, and uh, thinking about my ancestors. I walked past this tree, and this tree on this branch near the sidewalk had this little squirrel, and the squirrel was doing this kind of like mournful, cranky little cry. You know what this one mm-hmm. sounds like? You know, just kind of like a rattly sound or something. And it occurred to me, I'm like, does this squirrel think about his grandma? <laughs> An unanswerable question, but I had never had that thought before. Yeah, I doubt he knows his grandma. <laughs> he might know his mom. Yeah. Doesn't think about his mom. Oh, what no. is that like? Yeah. It's curious, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Studying the gym from another facet. That's right. Culture, are there any other pieces in that collection of my love for you as Daphne that you would like to share with? Yeah, there's one. I, it's sort of my personal favorite of the series. It's called Country Captain. It's this sort of square-ish pink piece made out of this old chenille bedspread me and one of my sons slept under until it just absolutely fell apart. And then I could use it in all my work. And so, hey. yeah, country, where I'm from and is Columbus, Georgia. It's near the Fort Benton military base. We had this dish growing up called Country Captain. It's an Indian dish, like it's East Indian origins. It's got curry and currants in it, fried chicken and this like gravy. We had nothing else like that growing up. Like it was truly the only curry dish in the lower Chattahoochee Valley in West Central Georgia that we had. But it was like 
terrific and wonderful. And it's what you served when you had nice company. You know, it was when you had a sit down with people from out of town over. Anyway, it came to my region of the world through Fort Benning. The dish got to us through the military. And so that piece is sort of about, and in that piece, I've got like a cantha quilt and then I've got the chenille, which was made in Georgia. So that piece is sort of about the cultural exchange that happens in conflict and the textile industry, which is conflicted. (laughs) And so, you know, I've got like these sort of Georgia and East Indian connections through food, military, and textiles in that piece. That piece has like three little soft packs of cigarettes, cigarette packets not the actual cigarettes, in the piece. And I found those in the front pocket of a work shirt, a couple of work shirts that were donated to me. So, you know, there's an instance of me using something besides textiles in that piece as well. Hi, I'm Jackie, part of the Quilty Nook team. Have you ever wanted a supportive community that you could turn to for inspiration and creative advice? At the Quilty Nook, We know how hard it can be to stay motivated if you don't have the support of other creative folks. That's why so many textile artists from across the world have been drawn to the Nook's online community, where you can connect with other makers who are exploring the same kinds of questions you are, no matter your skill level. To get your link to a free trial, check out the show notes and see for yourself what makes the Quilty Nook one of the friendliest corners of the internet. I am curious then from this piece, from Deathless, this collection, then you went on to water ground or was there something in between? It was hot water. Yeah, the river raft. Hot water. Yeah. Talk about those. Yeah, so hot water and water ground are all the same sort of set. It's all the same series. These are river raft quilts or what I call river raft quilts because I I made it up. (laughs) It's really these like quilted sculptures, wall sculptures that are like these sort of conceptual vessels, like rafts that somebody might take on a trip down a river, an imagined river, sort of as an escape journey or a journey to like a better place. I'm from a mill town. Columbus, Georgia is a cotton mill town. And the Chattahoochee River is the reason it exists. And so I grew up with this like almighty river that the whole existence, the whole reason the town was there. And so that's sort of the setting for these pieces. I sort of imagine you're on this quilted raft on the Chattahoochee River, going past the mills through Columbus down the falls to the Gulf of Mexico. And these rafts are equipped with all the things you might need for you and your children on that journey. So they'll have, like, pillows for your children's head, like, when they want to sleep, like, money bags. If you need to store cash, they have fishnets on them for catching food. Taking, like, some of them have, like, these crocheted doilies that act as, like, fish scales so that your raft will go faster if you need it to. They have sails, escape tunnels, all sorts of stuff. And they're all, like, you know, hand-sewn. I have to, like, build support structures for them and all sorts of stuff. A lot of them are, like, they'll have fitted sheets around them that it's filled with polyfill, so it looks kind of like it's floating, like a, you know, like a raft, so. This is an incredible concept, this idea of this floating island of... um... It, like basic, Salvation, yeah, survival. Escape supplies, <laughs> basically. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really love making those. This is, to me, what's so intriguing about your work and listening to you talk about it. Because I know that one of the things you think about is this aspect of voyeurism and mm-hmm. how much we can know about one another's lives mm-hmm. and how much the artist wants to show of their life through their work and how much they yep. withhold or want to withhold, right? That's right. And so the tension there for me as the viewer is really fascinating because this idea of a river raft quilt mm-hmm. with these escape supplies is built on a dark foundation, mm-hmm. right? It's built on the premise that someone needs to escape something. That's right. Right? We don't know what that premise is, though. No. And so it creates this really... Yeah. Strictly space for us as a viewer. Yeah, and it could be really anything, you know. And, I mean, you know, there's some things you can draw. Like, it's an escape for a person and their kids. But, you know, you can, like, as the viewer, it could be an escape from anything. It's, you know, it's really sort of meant to be open-ended or whatever. But the sort of, you know, promise and bond between mother and children is always going to be real prevalent in my work. And uh, you could certainly see, like, view these pieces without the kid aspect. But for me, making it on a personal level, that's definitely there and part of it. 
you know. But that's not needed info, really, <laughs> to be able to view it as an escape, you know, for people. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, and, like, the pieces are, they're dark, but they're also hopeful, and they're also playful, you know, like... I like for my work to always have, like, a real sense of humor and a sense of, like, color and play, you know, kind of bouncy, like, and sort of built on these sort of complicated, hard to deal with ideas sometimes, you know. Which is a gentle way of addressing these ideas and these questions, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's, I think it's what quilts can do so well. It is. And, you know, on the, I'm just like an eternal optimist. Like, I'm not a dark person, even though I address dark things and have dealt with dark things. I'm an optimistic person and so in general. And so I think in my work, like the bright colors, you know, like the playfully putting things next to each other, the stories and the narratives, you know, I try to, that offsets sometimes like, you know, the bad stuff for me. So in my work, or at least balances it out. And so what are you hopeful for in this work when someone sees it? Well, the things that I love, Mm -hmm. the things I like to see happen is when somebody goes up to a work and is like, I had that blanket, you know, that's my favorite. (laughs) When they're like, oh, I had that blanket growing up. But when I was five, I had that same blanket. You know, that's what I'm, even when it's like, or they'll say like my grandmother or my mother, or I made a quilt like that, you know, because not everything's mass produced, but like. So I really love those moments. Like, and then they'll tell me about it. Like one, you know, one woman was like, we had that blanket in our camper when we drove across Texas, you know? So I look forward to moments like that. And as the maker and as the artist, what is it about that moment of recognition that is so powerful for you? Yeah. And you know, it's real funny that it's those moments because in those moments I haven't actually done anything. (laughs) It's just the blanket. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. but you know, I feel like that that's sort of the lead in to them looking at other aspects of the work, you know, like if they can recognize that blanket, maybe they can recognize another part of the work and we can feel, you know, sort of in on this whole thing together. You know, the whole thing is not really about pushing boundaries and like expanding quilting and all that sort of stuff. For me, it's making connections to other people. And if I utilize other materials and utilize other art ways, then the mission is getting accomplished, you know. So it's much less pushing boundaries and much more trying to make connections. So, Culture, before we move on to the South, <laughs> but out, this will be a little sidebar conversation, okay. but before we move on to that, is there anything else you want to talk about with the Waterground series? No, I think it's, I think that's good. That's all, Well, that's all the river round quilts. It's all sort of the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Just want to make sure. Oh, I know what I want to ask you. Well, and that reminds me, Coulter, of something you said back on Softbook, which is at least uh, in the public answer to this question, which is your favorite fabric, you say you you love them all equally. They're all democratic to you, right? Mm -hmm. I love this idea that it doesn't matter whether it's a silk or a velvet or whether it's a century old quilt or a shirt that someone got at Walmart yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's not where it derives its value for you, but it's made its way to you from the person's home Mm -hmm. that gives it value. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Now look, is a piece of like beautiful lush blue velvet prettier than like you know a t-shirt from walmart yesterday yes i'm like aware of that but you know i really love all my donations the same and just because you're like a beautiful piece of blue velvet doesn't guarantee you're going to make it into a work you know like the work would maybe call for the t-shirt from walmart so it doesn't really give you more if you're a piece of fabric in my studio you don't stand a better chance at anything just because you're nicer it's all about what the work and the idea dictates and you know everybody every i talk about it like it's people these pieces of fabric for people but like every piece of fabric enters my studio with the same chance you know on the same footing I really like to view fabric that way I didn't always view it that way when I first started getting donations I was only using the quote-unquote good stuff and then over the course of the years I was like man these donations have gotten so much better I use them almost all now you know instead of getting rid of some of them and then I just realized the donations were staying exactly the same what was changing was my attitude toward what I was getting I was viewing fabric with much more open eyes after years you know so the donations changed me I'm glad for it yeah I like that just a moment ago I'm glad you caught it because I was going to ask you about talking about fabric as a person 
-hmm. you personified it so easily in that moment. And it makes me wonder what your relationship is. Do you talk to Fabric in your studio? I do greet my studio every morning. (laughs) That is so funny you Uh ask that. I walk in and I'm like, hey. (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm like, hey, y'all, hey, everybody, you know, and I'm really talking to my pieces, like, yeah, that's funny. I hadn't really thought about that very much, but I do, and especially if I've been gone for a few days, like if I can't go in there for a few days, they get a big greeting <laughs> when I walk in. <laughs> but anyway. I don't know how you would answer this question. I'm not asking it anyway, so good luck. Um, <laughs> what? role do the materials for you play in understanding the topic you're trying to explore? Like, do you approach these river raft quilts, for example, with a pretty firm idea already in mind, with the kind of story you want to tell? And, as opposed to or, what room is there for the materials to reveal something of the story as you're working? Yeah, so I'll go into a series, like, say, the River Raft Quilt, with only my lived experience, only my own personal stories. And I I read a lot of history. So I do a lot of history stuff. And so I go in with a little historical knowledge and a, a whole lot of knowledge of my own stuff, <laughs> sometimes too much. And then the rest is the fabric. I don't sketch. I don't make notes. I don't have a pencil in my studio. It's needle and thread, scissors, and glue, and nails, and power tools, you know. And so the fabric really leads the way. You know, oftentimes there'll be an element in a piece that I'll add, and then later on it will fit my narrative. Like there was one piece I did a while back. This was for the River Raft quilts. It's a piece called Hot Water, and it had this big crocheted square on it. It worked well compositionally. That's why I added it. Well, later when I was doing a little writing about it, because I had to, you know, every now and then you got to write about your stuff, I was like, that looks like... You know, I was like describing other parts of the piece. I was like, and here's an escape tunnel, and here's a flotation park where your kids can sit. And I was like, oh, and that looks like a helicopter landing pad. You know, like if you had an emergency and a helicopter needed to come help you out, like it could land on that. And so that's something that would not have occurred to me if the crocheted piece hadn't been in the studio to make that happen. You see what I'm saying? So. Mm -hmm. In that way, lots of times, I'd say it's about more than half the time the fabric shows up like with the good idea. Like, yeah, that really resonates to feel similarly that the artist's job is to be the the manual labor, the hand, the conduit Uh to just bring out the material. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it really can be like composing. Uh, You've got all the elements. You're just sort of you're putting them in the the right order. So. Your community building. Mm-hmm, yeah. There was something in there I wanted to ask you about. Let me think on it a second. And so then I imagined that when, like with this helicopter launch pad bit, for example, that that might be the kind of thing you would want to go and explore or reincorporate into other pieces in the same series. Is that something that you would do? Yeah, like things recur. Like there was one piece where I put an escape tunnel in there. And so then I put like an escape tunnel in like every piece, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, it was really just a leftover bowl. My father-in-law, he made some bowls in his carpentry studio, like wooden bowls on like a spinner thing. That What was left over to me, I was like, he gave them to me. And I was like, oh, I'll use that and put it on as an escape tunnel. So I would have never thought of an escape tunnel until he brought me that scrap that looked like an escape tunnel you see Mm -hmm. and so then I added a whole bunch of them to other works and then I started knitting escape tunnels and then I started like you know sewing them with upholstery foam and all sorts of stuff so well and that's what can be so fun about working in a series right like picking up on those key elements yeah that just seem like the note Mm -hmm. right or at least one of the notes and then going back and reincorporating them and yeah, and then, and then sort of seeing where it goes. Because, you know, if you work yeah. on a, it long enough, it will totally change into and morph sure into will. something new. I see, if I'm doing my math right, mm-hmm. we probably got about 10 more minutes or so mm-hmm. of chat time. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I know, I'm a terrible... If not, we can also... <laughs> I'm just answering your questions. I haven't, like... <laughs> no, it's, that's what makes a great conversation. Oh, okay, okay. No, I just want to make sure that whatever's top of mind for you makes its way into this conversation. It is, yeah. I mean, yeah, we're hitting all the good stuff, so. Yeah. Well, you want to move on to Southern White Amnesia then? Yeah, that sounds good. Let me think of how I want to segue. (laughs) (laughs) 
Coulter, when you agreed to talk with me on theme side, one of the things I was so interested to hear from you about was your experience with what I'm calling Southern white amnesia, right? Which Uh is this idea of the stories that Southern white families tell themselves and don't tell themselves about their own family history. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you're from Georgia. Are you folks from Georgia or do you go back generations in the South? Yeah, in Georgia on one side, many generations, uh, Louisiana Mm -hmm. on one, Alabama, the Mm -hmm. other. Yeah, we're pretty Southern. Okay, You might can tell that I'm from the South. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Mike could tell, Mike could tell. I am the family historian of my family. Mm-hmm. And if there's something that happened in our family, I'm the one that's going to know it. And I remember about five or so years ago, I ran across the first records that my family had enslaved some folks mm-hmm. back in the day. And I had never in my life heard my family talk about that. That had never been a topic of conversation. Not that people were actively sidestepping mm-hmm. the topic. It just wasn't. I don't know how else to say it. It just wasn't something we talked about. There was no curiosity about family history. Yeah. There was no curiosity about our own role in Southern history, you uh-huh. know? And so when I first found these records, it was a shock. So yeah. I went to someone in my family and I said, did we ever enslave anybody? Mm-hmm. And they said, no. And there's a little pause. <laughs> I think we would know. Yeah. And that for me was such a light bulb moment, Coulter, because I was like, how many other Southern white folks are walking around just assuming that if their family had had this role in history, that they would probably know. Yeah. And so that was actually the first piece I made in this series. This Mm -hmm. big, sheer pink house coat that I leave intact. I just do reverse application. I cut the letters out. I think we would know. Yeah. And I stitch it down on top of this Thumbonnet Sioux quilt, this old vintage quilt that already existed, you know. Yeah. And what I hadn't noticed about Thumbonnet Sioux is that she's always got that big old bonnet on so big you can't see her face. Mm -hmm. For folks that aren't familiar with the block, it's just kind of healthy, roundish <laughs> little girl <laughs> that kind of like smurf like yeah. think smurf proportions in profile. and she's all yeah. in profile and she's got this blind these this bonnet on so you can't see her face ever right mm-hmm. and she's got a good friend named overall sam overall sam is always wearing mm-hmm. you guessed it overalls and a big mm-hmm. hat and he has his back to us every time and so what was so interesting to me about this block considering this question was i think we would know but why would we know we don't mm-hmm. At least speaking for my family, we don't ask those questions. We're not even faced in the right direction to ask those questions, yeah. right? We're so absorbed in our own personal storylines mm-hmm. that we're not even thinking about the history and the roots. Yeah. And so I'm just curious to kind of unpack that with you a little bit and maybe what your own experience is with your family mm-hmm. and well, how you see that. I come from a family of, my father's a folklorist. My mom is I always knew that we knew the ancestry from way, way back. My dad's can't go back as far as my mom's, but hers goes back up, or mine, a really pretty good way back in Georgia. Anyway, we had the records, you know, the family records we've, I've always known. But, you know, I come from a family where we talk about that stuff. My parents are really wonderful, open people, and not that if you don't talk about it, you're not, but my parents are, they're basically historians is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I've always uh, known about all that, you know, all that stuff. My dad does genealogy. My mom's done genealogy. But I know not everybody's family is like that. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the experience, especially, you know, people's experiences aren't monolithic. There's like just in my own family, sort of the different ancestral, ancestry wise, like the different experience from, say, like the mill workers and the people who owned Emanuel County in Georgia. Vastly different experiences there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, you know, when you take the time to learn your family history, you're not going to learn one history. Like you're saying, you're going to learn all sorts of histories. Those are sort of the things I try to put into my work. I'm trying to connect all these things together, you know, because that's really sort of what I'm fascinated, like how all these paths come together in one spot, well, and that spot being you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the or artist. That spot being me. Yeah, or you. Yeah, like the person mm-hmm. who's alive doing the thing right now. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, and it's, you know, so when I make these works with all these like remnants of lives from all around me, and then it comes into one work about all of us, you know, so. Well, this is what, it's just my mind can't get enough of trying to wrap itself around this puzzle, Mm -hmm. which like this quilt I'm working on now that's going to have over 2,000 squares Mm -hmm. of just 10 generations, just my family that's been in the country since the country became a country in 1776. So like that's just 2,000 people. All of those people 
mm-hmm. gave me something. They are literally written into my flesh and bone. Yeah. In the form of genes, right? Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? And what does it mean when we know a lot about our ancestors? And what does it mean if we don't know a lot about our ancestors? Mm-hmm. And what's the impact? One of the, I think the piece I'll work on next after this is studying intergenerational wealth because it sounds like similar to you Mm -hmm. one side of my family was the wealthy side Mm -hmm. and that's where you find the judges and the doctors and the lawyers Mm -hmm. right and the people who had higher education and then the other side is all just like yeah some of them had land some of them didn't some of them had enough to eat and some of them didn't that's right and what's so fascinating to me like i like to just make myself the case study here because on these two branches of my family tree on one side you have this legacy of higher education Mm-hmm. On the other side, my parent, my dad, was the first one in his family to go to college. Yeah. And when you track that on a parallel track with whose family and slave folks and whose family didn't, yeah. and we think about resources and material wealth that get passed down. That's right. We got to say at least part of it. Come on, folks. At least part of it. Yeah trickles back, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's what, and it's the point that you're saying, it's like the reverse river delta, right? That like all the parts Mm -hmm. flow back to me and this story and my story. Yeah, and all of our stories have so many commonalities, you know, even if you're from different circumstances or from different places or especially from different time periods, like we do go through the same things under different circumstances. We go through the same emotions. We go through, you know, the same losses and same gains, sometimes worse than others. And, you know, but these are all things that happen to us as like the human experience and whether it's real big or real small. Uh, And so these are all these little pieces of those things that I find in all these old clothes. And and that's what I try to put it all together in one piece, you know, really under the like vehicle of my own personal story. But really it's, all these stories together, all these narratives sort of collected in one spot. Yeah. And like, I can never find enough of them. Like I'll never not be interested. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, how deep is the self? Yeah. It's, it's the same answer. Yeah, the same just answer goes right? How deep is the self? Right? And also I'll never run out of materials because we're such like a material no. laden society and work like planet. Like I'll never run out of supplies. Like there will always mm-hmm. be clothes, you know, and mm-hmm. there will always be leftover clothes. I mean, Unfortunately, that's the case because we make so much, but like, it's good for me and that like, I'll always have art supplies. So abundant. Mm-hmm. Well, culture, I wonder how you would answer this question. Feel free to take your time if you want to think about it for a second. But one of the things that uh, the central question that I'm exploring with theme side is how is working with textiles made you more human? How has it connected you to yourself or to others in a way that would not have happened if you hadn't been working with textiles? And I'd be curious to know what one response to that might be for you. Well, I think my response is that what makes me connect to textiles is the fact that people are behind the textiles. Like, it's what didn't really connect me with painting. It's like, I wouldn't necessarily want to use, like, brand new textiles, even though there's stories there. But, like, for me, what makes <laughs> me feel human about textiles is the humans behind the textiles that come to me. So, I mean, you know, they're close, and the audience knows this, too, because we're all textile people. But they're so intimate, you know? They're like, touch your body, There's and they're everywhere. We couldn't exist without them, you know? They've been around since the very beginning. And, you know, in a lot of ways, they're the most human material there is in my eyes. And uh, so, you know, that, I think... That's a good question because I think textiles are sort of like not just human, but like especially human above other materials. Oh, that's a beautiful thought. So, Coulter, I imagine that in a few minutes once we get off this call, you're going to walk down the street. You're going to go to your studio. You're going to say howdy to all your pieces. (laughs) And you'll get to work. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That sounds pretty nice. Mm Coulter, thank you so much for talking with me this morning. Well, Zach, thanks for having me. This has been a really fun conversation, and um, I like your questions. (laughs) <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, me too, because this is what I wonder about. And so it's so nice to get him out of my head and into somebody else's. Yeah, no, 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 no. It was great. I had a good time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And there you have it. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of that conversation. And I would say make sure you're subscribed so you get all these episodes as soon as they drop. And think about leaving me that review, huh? Take care, and y'all go so something good. Mm-hmm.